We are joined by one keynote speaker, Sheikh Ustad Nu'man Ali Khan, who is the founder and CEO of Bayina, and a lead instructor for similar programs, especially those linked to Arabic language. And he has taught more than 10,000 students throughout traveling seminars and programs. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh, Sheikh. Welcome to show and thank you for joining us. It's a great honor to be Could here. Can you please tell us a little about your participation in the convention? Alhamdulillah, I was actually pretty surprised and very pleased to get the invitation to come and speak here. Exactly. Uh, Alhamdulillah, I'm going to be doing two sessions here. Uh, the first of them is on the linguistic miracle of the Quran, and the second one is on peaceful coexistence and the Quran's view on peaceful coexistence. Mashallah. Now, uh, it is uh, very interesting and challenging at the same time to try to highlight the uh, linguistic miracles of the Holy Quran in another language. That's right. How do you go about this difficulty? Well, it, it has a lot to do with my personal journey. When I far first started learning the Arabic language for the sake of understanding the Quran, my first impression was that Arabic is very complicated. It's not a simple language. But as I studied more and more, I realized it's a very mathematical, systematic language. Almost like studying Nahu is similar to studying chemistry, how you know, different elements react to each other, it's how different words react to each other. And studying Sarf is almost like studying engineering and how different materials are made up, and you know, architecture even, the architecture of words. So this was the technical studies that I kind of approached from a scientific uh, way, and I found it very logical and very easy to understand, alhamdulillah. Then beyond that, obviously, is the science of Balagha, which is where the, the beauty of the language lies. And even there, it's actually pretty systematic and uh, methodical. If you have the basis in the original sciences, uh, an nahu and uh, a sarf, then moving on to the more advanced sciences of Arabic, it becomes easier. Now, my job as a teacher, because I used to teach elementary school, I taught little children. And I believe that the most effective teachers are the teachers that can teach children. Because to keep their attention, to make things simple, to make them remember, that's a real challenge. So I thought of all of this as basically something complicated, but it's made up of simple parts. And if you ask me to explain the simple part in English, I can do it. But if you ask me to explain the whole thing, it seems complicated. So I decided to take the approach of breaking it down to its simplest parts and explaining it like I'm explaining it to a child. Nice. And subhanAllah, it worked. You know, first I told some of my teachers, uh, my, my Arab ulama, the, the, the teachers that I have, that I want to teach something about al-Balagha al-Qur'aniya in English. And they said, you're crazy, it can't be done. It's very, yeah. You know, they, you have to know Nahu, you have to know Saf, you have to know the, you know, Arabic, without it, who can get it? The audience has to know as well. Or right, at they least, have to have a lot yeah, of background. background yes. So I said, well, let me try. Let me experiment with this a little bit. Right, so I did, alhamdulillah, and through experience, I traveled with a small program called Divine Speech. And the purpose of it was to highlight the beauty of the Qur'an from different aspects. I don't even use words like balagha, actually, when I teach. I say the Qur'an is literature, the literary appreciation of the Qur'an. Because who in the audience is going to know the word balagha? They're not going to know. So I taught this to Muslim and non-Muslim audiences in the United States in over almost uh, 80, 90 locations, alhamdulillah. So that program alone was attended by about 40,000 people, alhamdulillah, throughout. And to my surprise, at that program, to my knowledge, there were at least 25, 30 shahadas. Just at the, it wasn't even a da'wah program. I was just explaining the beauty of the Qur'an. But people would come up and just take shahada, subhanAllah. Just from listening to this, uh, these just, examples? Just from this example, yeah. Okay, uh, so. do you use any uh, PowerPoint presentations or, or uh, other materials, teaching materials in that program or not? I, for my own research, I use a lot of materials. So, you know, my, my research into an ayah begins with something like Lisan al-Arab and keeps going until I read even the modern works of people like uh, Dr. Fadl Salih Hassan al Ra'i and others yeah. who've done remarkable work. Yeah. Uh, actually, I believe people like him have made Balagha and Balagha Qur'aniya easy to understand even for Arabs. True, true. So um, I take advantage of a lot of their work and try to incorporate it. But when, you, when I convert it to English, it's not just translating words, it's translating ideas. And every language has a culture. So it's, most of my work is not the research. Most of my work is thinking about how am I going to present this? How to present it, yes, yeah. that is the main challenge. That's the real challenge, yeah. And, and I think you have other uh, programs besides the seminars and some websites as well to promote that? Or That's correct, that yeah. So I, as I started studying the Qur'an more, I realized that translations are missing a lot. Uh, there's a lot of beauty and there's a lot of wisdom that is just impossible if you translate one line for one line. And we all know that from an aqidah perspective. But even practically, it's, I think the cost is too high. And I also realize that people aren't, uh, they're not reading books like they used to. 
people are now watching a YouTube video or they're watching TV, you know, it's, that's the more popular media. So I worked on a video translation of the entire Quran with an explanation, an easy explanation. Alhamdulillah, it's done. Mashallah. And so my, most of my work now is creating resources that other schools and individuals can use to learn the Quran for themselves. Uh, so this is what I call Bayina TV. And on it also, interestingly, uh, I, my daughter, she's 12 years old now, I started teaching her in America, I started teaching her Anahu when she was 10. 15 minutes a day, 10 minutes, 15 minutes a day, at home. But I decided to record the classes so that others can benefit. And now there are about 20,000 people that are actually learning from her, subhanAllah, okay. Okay. So, from our classes. So the so. basic uh, experiment was with your own daughter. Yes, that's that right. Mashallah. And it worked, how, how is she in the language now? At the She's age pretty of good. She can do Arab of an ayah pretty decently. And she Mashallah. can do tasleef. Yeah, Mashallah. she can do pretty decent tasleef. We have many students who can map, even though they are from Arabic descent. Subhanallah. Subhanallah, Mashallah. Interesting. Now, now uh, how will the audience uh, appreciate that as uh, miraculous? To them being a literature and fine yeah. literature, for example, this is easy for a non-Muslim to understand. Yeah. But the miraculous aspect, how do you go about uh, you see, this point? That, that ties into linguistics and it all ties into how you present it. A lot of times our tafasir and our scholars, they present a very powerful idea. But I read and I feel like they don't even realize how powerful their own idea is. Because it hasn't been presented in a provocative way. right? So it's the same concepts, but when I present it, to, just to give you an example, uh, when I'm, as I'm speaking to you, we've only been speaking for a couple of minutes. So I don't remember what I said In the beginning. two minutes ago. I, I don't recall. If you ask me to repeat my sentence word for word, I can't do it. It's, it's impossible for me. So if I use the words night and day, I don't remember. Or maybe I said day and night. Maybe I changed the sequence. I don't remember. In the Quran, when Allah talks about the heart, like, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ الْعَرَيْبَ فِي فِي الْقَلْبِ Right? All of, everything's about the qalb. Yes. So when the, the side. Yeah, yeah. So with the heart. So when the ayah comes, خَتَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ وَعَلَىٰ سَمْعِهِمْ The qulub are first. Start with the qulub first. Because the entire subject matter was qulub. Now, when you go to Surah Al-Jathiyah, وَخَتَمَ عَلَىٰ سَمْعِهِ وَعَلَىٰ قَلْبِ وَبَصَرِهِ وَجَعَلَ عَلَىٰ سَمْعِهِ وَقَلْبِهِ وَجَعَلَ عَلَىٰ بَصَرِهِ مِشَاوَىٰ and I it wondered, why, why did Allah one. change the sequence like that? And you realize, this is the 23rd ayah. But 15 ayat before this, in the 8th ayah, Allah said, So what's the crime? He doesn't listen. He doesn't listen. Doesn't he doesn't listen. So when Allah mentions the punishment, He mentions the hearing first. The hearing. Now, 15 sentences ago, I don't remember. That's right. That's right. How does, it's not possible for a human being to remember. And to keep it consistent, from one place in the Quran to another. So the so, context is always uh, in the context. Yeah, and it's consistent it is with the context. with exactly what is going on. Right. And, and this goes on throughout the Holy Quran. That's so, correct. Although some of the uh, verses are revealed uh, at, at, at very far uh, that's away correct. parts. That's correct. The and the, add very to that another problem. When I'm writing something, I have a chance to go back and edit. But when I'm speaking, it's done. This is oral. It's, so there is no way to correct There's anything. no editorial it's process. It's done the first time. So. That in itself, if you sit down and sit with a linguist. Very interesting. Or, you know, May Allah Almighty, inshallah, guide Allah you Allah. and help you with this great. Inshallah, we'll continue after this short break. Sure. Dear viewers, it's time now for a short break. We'll return soon to continue our discussion with Sheikh Ustad Nu'man Ali Khan. Stay with us. Welcome back. We are coming to you live from the Dubai International Peace Convention. And we are continuing our discussion with Sheikh Ustad Nu'man Ali Khan. Uh, Sheikh Nu'man, uh, one of the uh, key uh, points or, or topics of today is the peaceful coexistence in Islam. Right. What are the uh, bases for peaceful coexistence in Islam? I believe that Islam has provided us more than one basis for peaceful coexistence. And I probably think the biggest example of it is the practical life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One of the most fascinating things to me about the character of the Rasul sallallahu is that in the earliest revelations, Allah told us, إِنَّكَ لَعَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ And this is pretty remarkable because Allah is using His character and His relations with people as an evidence that He's a messenger. So His khuluq or His character was established among the people 40 years and those 40 years are an evidence in the Qur'an. Right? So the Qur'an isn't just using Him as an example after revelation began, but even from before. Now, what that tells us is that the Qur'an's message was it, it needed a 
the character of the Prophet in which he displayed the best mannerisms towards people. As a role model, as so a in, role. Every, in every aspect. So towards his neighbors, towards business partners, towards friends, his character was the, known among the people. And the Meccans were not easy to impress, as we know. So when they call him a Sadiq Qalameen, it's a big deal. The, the other thing is, you know, in, in, along the same lines, the word coexistence actually means that I live with my neighbor, I don't kill him and he doesn't kill me. I don't fight with him, he doesn't fight with me. But I think Islam asks for a lot more. It takes it to a higher to level. Much higher level. You know, coexistence on an airplane flight is I don't push my guy, the person in front of me, I don't push his seat. Keep my borders. You know, and I do, he doesn't pour coffee on me. That's coexistence. <laughs> but Islam really, through the, through the Messenger's example, alayhi salatu wasalam, rahmatan lil alameen, you know, a manifestation of one of Allah's attributes, ar-Rahman, you know, it promoted this idea that we have to have love for humanity. You know, and even coexistence isn't enough. And this is something that I feel most of the Muslims have forgotten. That when we see another human being, the first thing we think of is we have to have love for this creation of Allah. وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا He didn't say Al-Muslimin, he said Bani Adam. If Allah honored him, how can I not honor him? You know, so the, the, the study of the Quran for me gave me more and more respect for every, just human beings in general. And I think if we are going to teach this lesson to Muslims, we have to begin by teaching respect and love for Muslims for other Muslims first. And once we create that, then automatically it will spread you know, beyond that. Today I find we don't even have enough courtesy for each other. You know, we don't have enough patience with each other. So if you don't have patience in your own family, how will you show patience to your neighbor and other, other people, you know? So I think it's, it's a big project, but its basis is actually just really the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. Yeah. And, and how does Islam go about promoting that within the society? See, to me, all the values of Islam are promoted through the Qur'an. It is something that we go back to every single salah. And the teachings, the values of the Qur'an keep coming up over and over and over again. Just to give you one example that I find very powerful. A Christian group from Najran came to meet Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and they're obviously they're they're ministers, they're they're preachers of Christianity, and they want to understand what the Prophet is saying, alaihi But until they become Muslim, they worship Jesus. They're on, yes. The Messenger, alaihi does not put them in somebody's house. He doesn't put them in a hotel. He doesn't put them. He puts them in Al Masjid al Nabawi. And like the central mosque of Islam. The mosque of Islam, and they are going to worship Jesus inside this mosque. For the duration of their stay, they're going to pray, yes. and they're going to pray their own way. But that's okay. Even in the Masjid al Nabawi, the Prophet allowed this. Beautiful. You know, it's incredible. Now, this example to me is so powerful because the invitation to Allah's house, first of all, and to put them in the most sacred place, and then to allow them to pray the way they want while the da'wah is going on and the conversation the is going on. The discussion is going on. Yes. Talk about this. It's, more than coexistence. I mean, this is hospitality, you know. So this welcoming attitude towards the other. I, for example, back in America, I'm actually very good friends with a couple of priests, ministers from different Christian denominations. And I even have a friend who's a rabbi. And we disagree most of the time. <laughs> we say that we disagree. But we're still good friends. We talk and we discuss. And I think it's not, we're not going anywhere. I told them, we're a minority in America, Muslims. I said, look, we're not going anywhere, and you're not going anywhere. We better learn to live with each other. <laughs> we're not going to agree, we're not going to become one anytime soon, but that's okay. We can still talk to each other and respect each other. At least, yeah, you the know? people of the book, especially, are that's quite correct. close. Yeah. Now, uh, interesting, you mentioned a very uh, critical point, which is uh, our own practices within ourselves. Now, uh, any, any special uh, suggestions for us to increase that in our lives? Any little things that we can change, especially for our, our audience, for our young and so on and so Yeah, on. sure. You know, we, like I travel, alhamdulillah, quite a bit. And I notice the differences. We, for example, when we're standing in a line at a restaurant and some, somebody comes in, they're looking for a way to squeeze ahead instead of standing in their place, right? And even this small thing, like this happened to me at one of the airports. I was, you know, standing in line, waiting for the passport, you know, control. And some brother is behind me, and every time I turn, he tries to take one step, he's next to me, then he's in front of me. Okay. And instead of getting angry, and he had two more friends. He's like, well, you do it too. Right? So I, instead of getting angry, I said, you know what, Eid Mubarak, go ahead, please. Go it's okay. Yes. Very interesting. It's not worth it. Nice. You know, but we've developed this attitude that I have to get what I want first, 
Forget everyone else. I have to cross the street first, forget the car. Or the car says, forget the pedestrian, you know? Or the person says, let me order my food first, forget everyone else. Even at a conference, people want to meet the Shaykh. Right, they push each other to shake his hand, right? But the Islam teaches you have respect for everyone. You have to have a soft corner to everybody and Salat itself teaches us that. Now think about when people try to touch Hijar Aswad. When the Salah is going on, everybody's in one row, soft shoulders, perfect discipline. As soon as the Salah is over, a wrestling match begins. They start, yeah. You know? Where's وَيُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ Where did it go? You know, so we need a constant reminder to the Muslims in small things in life. Like when you're about to eat, offer your brother. When you're about to ask a question, you know, to the teacher, see if your other students, did they have a question first? Just a little bit of adab. If we can do this in the little things, it will happen in the big things, you know. So we have to start with our young. And Absolutely. So, uh, and, and this is a cultural thing as well, not just religious. It's so they, they actually culture. imitate, they take by example. That's correct. So yeah. th this makes it much more important for the guardian and the parents. So. Yeah. And, and even in a culture, you know, it's hard. Like if I gave everybody a chance to get in front of me in line, you know what? I will never get my turn. Right? So we get used to pushing and shoving and getting our way and becoming selfish, especially if the whole society is doing this. So this cannot be done by one person. It has to be by a whole family, then by a whole neighborhood, then by a whole community. But it starts with the family. You know, if the family can implement these values, then everybody else will implement these values. You know, and the, the first kind of courtesy we learn to teach in coexistence is between siblings. It's not a small thing. The first murder in Islam is between brothers. You know, in humanity, the first murder is between brothers. So when brothers and sisters are jealous of each other or they're fighting inside the house, that's a big problem. It's not a small problem. We think it's just kids that are fighting. It's not a small thing. It's a big thing because this, the greatest crimes in Islam began with this. Jealousy between siblings. So this is something we can help at home. You know, and even look at the ayat. Allah talked about Habil and Qabil. And then he talked about Meaning this has an impact on humanity at large. You know, so there are lots of responsibilities inside the house. That is a very deep idea. We need to uh, get our attention, inshallah, yeah, to it. And thank you very much for joining us, inshallah. My we'll pleasure. see you in the future as well. Jazakallah khair for your points yeah, and yeah. insights. Thank you so Jazakallah much. khair. Thank you very it's much. such a pleasure being here. Dear viewers, I'd like to thank on your behalf our guest, Sheikh uh, Ustad Nu'man Ali Khan. We supplicate to Allah Almighty to help us understand our religion better and practice it in the best way we can. And it's time now for another short break. We'll be back soon to continue our special episode with our special guest, Sheikh uh, Dr. Zakir Naik. Stay with us. Welcome back. During the Dubai International Peace Convention, a variety of renowned scholars and sheikhs are delivering lectures on peace, peaceful coexistence, and cooperation. And we're glad to have with us some of them in this episode. We are glad to be joined by Dr. Zakir Naik, a well-known speaker with a unique style that presents a fresh and enlightening picture of Islam in simple English terms, making it fast and easy to understand. Welcome to the show, Doctor, again, inshallah. So, uh, could you please uh, tell us how does the Messenger, peace be upon him, and the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, uh, promoted peace and practice in their lives? As far as you see the life of the Sahaba, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they promoted peace in various ways. Number one was in action and in deeds. The way they presented themselves, the way they spoke to the friends, to the family members, the way they spoke to the enemies also. That itself, as the Quran says, that you have to win over the enemies in uh, Surah Fusilat, chapter number 41, verse number 34, that you have to be good to them so they win the over. Besides that, they even spoke and they called people with words. So there is Dawah calling people to peace with action and deeds and calling people to peace with words. So both of them are part of how they call people to the peace and Islam. And uh, how does the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him himself and his life uh, and especially with his relationship with the uh, others, the non-Muslims, in practice, any, any special uh, highlights of this in the life of the Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? If you see the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu you have hundreds of examples how he promoted peace and how he behaved with the non-Muslim. We have a beautiful example where Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam walked and there was a woman who used to throw dirt on him every day. On the path of On the path and used to throw on him and he never used to object. 
And after several days, when one day she did not throw dirt, so he, he went to find out what was wrong with her. Mm. And she was sick and he prayed for her and she accepted Islam. So here you find many examples how the Prophet behaved with the non-Muslim. And his main mission was, as the Quran says in Surah Anbiya, chapter number 21, verse number 107, Allah says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمِتَ الْعَالَمِينَ That we have sent thee not, but as a mercy to all the creatures, as a mercy to all the world, as a mercy to the whole of humanity. Now, in his call and in the Sahaba's call to Islam, the main highlights of that was the unity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the supplication to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and freedom from any other supplication to other human being. Is this linked to peace in any way? Yes, if you, if you, if you read the seerah and, and, and the life of the Sahabas, the main call was towards Tawheed, which was number one peace. And how is Tawheed linked with peace? Tawheed means believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not to worship anyone else besides Him and not to, not to associate any partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this call is linked because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a salam, is the source of peace. So unless you do not understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how will you attain peace? So the main source of peace is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So unless you do not worship Him, and do not associate partners with him, you will not get true peace. You may get temporary peace, maybe with money, with luxury. All these are temporary, they aren't permanent. The permanent peace is salam, the source of peace is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So only through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can you attain this ultimate peace which cannot be achieved with money, with luxury. The true peace is peace of mind, peace of heart, which is ultimate peace. Subhanallah. Now, uh, the submission to Allah Almighty means no other submission to any human beings. And this probably helps solve many conflicts among humanity. That's, why, that's the reason what I say that if you read in the Quran, according to me, the master key, the most important verse for Dawa, while speaking to non muslim is Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64, where Allah SWT says, Al -Kitab, Say, O people of the book. Come to come in terms as in us any. Which is the first term? Allah na'udha illallah. That we worship the nam. None but Allah. Allah continues. And he says, Wala nushika bhi shayya. That we associate no partner with him. Wala yattakhi zabad dun abad dun arba bhumun din illa. That we erect not among ourselves. Lords and pit other than Allah. Fa in tawalla. If then they turn back. Fa khulu shadu. Say ibe witness. We are not Muslim, that we are Muslims bowing all to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So according to me, this verse of the glorious Quran is the master key for doing da'wah. That come to come in terms with the Ahli Kitab, Jews and Christian, but it can be applicable to any Muslim, any non-Muslim. Whether it be Hindu, whether it be Parsi, whether it be Buddhist, come to come in terms as in us and you. And the most important commonality is Allah namad illallah. That we worship none but Allah, that we associate no partner with him. This is the most important factor of Dawa. You may talk to him about anything else. To start Dawa with, to start, you can talk about science, you can talk about not to have alcohol, not to have pork, but unless you do not speak about Tawheed, unless you do not remove the shirk part in the life of the non-Muslim, you will not be achieving your goal. Because as Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 48, and in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 116, that if Allah pleases, He may forgive any sin, but the sin of shirk He'll never forgive. So the most important aspect of calling people towards Islam, calling people towards peace, is removing the shirk, associating partners, and worshipping only one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, uh, one interesting uh, aspect of this is, uh, how is this general peace linked with the inner peace? You pointed out that there are many sources of temporary peace, or superficial one. But how do we reach the inner peace inside? Which is that I, what we see, what human beings normally crave for, they have a perception that if I have this, I'll get peace. And all of these are false. They are temporary. For example, a person thinks that if I have money, then I can buy anything in the world. I can buy a good apartment, I can buy a good villa, I can buy a good car, and this will get him peace. But when he acquires this, he realizes that there's no supervision. It may get temporary happiness, it will fade away minutes. very quickly. Yes, but it will fade away. The inner peace is a sense in your mind and in, in your heart. That when you realize the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if a poor man, he may be poor, if he has faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and if he satisfied his peace only, only by offering salah, 
the amount of peace a person gets by subbing you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is multiple times superior than what any money can buy. So this inner peace is peace with your creator. So when you understand your creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and when you understand the source of peace Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you worship him alone, that peace is permanent inshallah, irrespective whether you're rich or poor, whether you're black or white, whether you're living in a big apartment or in the hut, that peace is a sense which is permanent. Subhanallah. Is the, uh, the principle of moderation in Islam and the principle of balance between the spiritual and the material, between body and soul, linked with this inner peace that you are telling us about? It is not linked completely. It can be, it cannot be depend. Actually for a Muslim, a Muslim the Quran says that if something good happens, he says, Alhamdulillah. Uh -huh. If something what he considers bad is, Alhamdulillah, min Allah. So if, if a businessman gets the great prophet, he says, Alhamdulillah. If he goes in the north, he says, Alhamdulillah. But this peace that is there, that it is because of qadar of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He finds there is something good in this loss. If he gets sick, he may feel pain. But if, and the hadith, Muhammad sallam said, that for a moment, if he gets sick, it is washing away sin. So if he understands the concept of Islam the and believes in Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's happy to be sick. He's happy that fine, my sins are being washed away. So that in the Akhirah, the life after death is a permanent life. This is temporary. The ultimate peace is in the Akhirah that is attained in Jannah. The final peace a human being can get is in Jannah. So this can be attained by following the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. And that is the ultimate goal. So if a person in this world, if he suffers, he may have some calamity. He may get sick, he may become poor, but he feels this is ultimate for my akhirah. And I always say in an examination, when you sit for an examination, just before the test, you work hard. You don't say, okay, I have to, I mean, you sleep less, because that's the test. So Allah says in the Quran in Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 2, it's Allah who has created the death and life to test which of his good indeeds. So if you understand this is the test, you wouldn't mind struggling for the final achievement of passing in the hereafter. So when a person is struggling for his final exam, he's looking forward for distinction. the results. So here, if we have difficulties, we as Muslims, we should be happy that we're doing it for the Akhirah. And the Akhirah, attaining Jannah is the ultimate peace. Thank you. These guidelines will help any person who is afflicted with trials or tribulation or turmoil to have patience and perseverance and look to the pride side of this. That inshallah Allah Almighty will forgive him and bless him in the hereafter. Thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Zak and Mike. Jazakallah khair. Hope to see you in the future, inshallah. The viewers, I'd like to thank on your behalf our guest, Dr. Zak and Mike. We supplicate to Allah Almighty to help us understand our religion better and practice it in the best way we can. Amen. It's time now for another short break. We'll be back with Sheikh Mufti Ismail Mink to discuss more on peace. Stay with us. Welcome back. Dear viewers, we are joined now by Sheikh Mufti Ismail Mink, who is the appointed head of Fatwa Department of Majlis al Ulum and the main Muslim body in Zimbabwe and a lecturer at Dar al Ulum Institute in Harare. Welcome to the show, uh, Sheikh. Mashallah. Thank you very much for joining us, and we are glad, and our viewers as well, inshallah, to benefit from your knowledge and experiences. It's a pleasure. Jazakallah. Sheikh, uh, usually Islam is referred to as the uh, religion of peace. What are the bases for this? Where does it come from? Islam is uh, unique in the sense that it governs every single aspect of our existence, our lives. You find the rules of Islam. Uh, some people say that there are too many rules, but in actual fact, every single rule and regulation of Islam uh, is put in place in order to ensure that we lead lives that are full of calmness and peace within ourselves, as well as with others. Up to the day we die, we will still have peace even in the hereafter. So this is the holistic uh, uh, Islam that we have. It deals with uh, both the internal and the external in this world and in the next. Uh, what are the uh, practical aspects in the religion itself that leads uh, Islam to become peaceful? Uh, firstly, the relation with uh, your maker, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he who has made you. And we believe as Muslims that you only worship the one who made you, you know. Uh, if we worship anyone besides the one who made us, then it will snatch away that peace that we are searching for so much. So firstly, peace with the maker, subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Uh, secondly, peace with oneself. You know, we need to recognize who we are, where we came from, where we are right now, where we are heading. All this is extremely important because uh, if man does not ponder for a moment uh, who he is and where he is going, uh, obviously he won't be able to live his life in a fruitful way. Uh, also, we need to be at peace with the destiny that Allah has chosen for us. Uh, each one of us has been born in a specific uh, place. We belong to specific tribes, we belong to specific places and so on. Uh, certain things we have had no choice about. We need to be at peace with that because it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who chose that for us. So uh, this would uh, obviously uh, be, uh, the, in, the inner peace would be promoted in that. When it comes to the relations with others, it's extremely important to know that Islam has based a very, very solid foundation on the relation with others, the fulfillment of what is known as Hukukul Ibad, which means the rights of fellow human beings. Uh, and that is so important because without that, there will be chaos uh, on earth. So I need to be kind with you know those around me, whether it is my family members, the neighbors, the Muslims or the non-Muslims, uh, those whom I agree with, those whom I disagree with. I cannot harm uh, the people. Uh, I cannot uh, cause any form of harm and I will not be harmed uh, in return. The Prophet sallallahu says, la darar wa la dirar. You know, that hadith has so many meanings to it. It's so deep. In essence, there is no harm uh, that should be inflicted and no harm that should be received as well. Upon you. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it is important for us to know that the, the, the rights of the fellow human beings, uh, uh, that is mainly what would ensure global peace as well. Uh, the less we have of the fulfillment of the rights of others, the more chaos we have. Uh, today, if you look at the problems that we are facing, for example, uh, what needs to happen, we need to understand the rights of others and fulfill them in the best possible way. Also in Islam, something extremely important, we should be at peace with the environment. You know, we do not uh, destroy the, the ecosystem or the environment, whether it is plants or anything else, animals and so on. Uh, we should be at peace with all this. And these are in-depth teachings of Islam that we should all be studying, inshallah, and put into practice. Yeah, subhanallah. So it's not only about uh, what is right for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but also the rights of people. So does the Holy Quran highlight these different types of peaceful uh, relationship definitely, with others? Definitely. Uh, the, the Quran has highlighted that there are two major uh, types of rights. The Hukukullahi wa Hukukul Ibadi. Uh, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like for example in Surah Al-Baqarah, where Allah says, Ya ayyuhal nas, u'budu rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum. O people, worship your Rabb, your, your creator, nourisher, sustainer, who has made you, who created you in the first place. Hukukullah. And there are so many details of what he wants us to do. We will pray, we will not worship anyone but him, we will fulfill our zakah, we will so many things that uh, we would do for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wala tansawul fadla baynakum. Do, do not forget the virtue between you, amongst you. Uh, the virtue amongst us is to fulfill each other's rights, to be kind to each other and to be able to uh, respect one another. And this is why we say even a non-Muslim, it is extremely important for us to reach out to those who don't know about Islam because the peace that we enjoy uh, is noticeable in our lives. The more you practice the deed, the happier a person you are. You know, you can see a person's face and you can actually tell, mashallah, this person is in so much calmness and yet they might have worldly problems, but you will not notice it because they have dealt with the worldly problems in a way that the Almighty has taught them to deal with it. And this is why even if a person suffers health problems or the death of a loved one or financial loss or so many other what we would term negative things that happen in this particular worldly life, how to deal with it is taught by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in order for us to achieve this peace. And with one another, the most important thing is as Muslims, we earn rewards every time we, we deal with individuals in a beautiful way. So for me, if I speak to you in a nice way, it is clocking the coins that I need to earn the paradise. So it's such a unique, uh, you know, uh, gift of Allah that everything I do, uh, I, I would actually make sure that I do it in the best possible way. And this is why in one of the narrations of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he actually says that when Allah has, when Allah, Allah loves that when someone does something, they do it properly. 
they do it correctly, they do it in the best way possible because that is the capacity Allah has given myself and yourselves. So there is always a motivation be behind dealing with anything that happens to us uh, in life. There is always a motivation and there is always something to look forward to. Uh, and there are two types of things. One is motivation to do good and the other is motivation to abstain from bad. So if, for example, uh, I have something that is compulsory, that I will be rewarded for it definitely. Like if I pray five times a day, I'm rewarded and so on. And all this is a payment for my life after death. When I die, I would like a beautiful place that I'm going to eternally go to because in this world, I will not be here for more than 60 or 70 years on average. So uh, firstly, what I need to know that, that, that which is compulsory, I will achieve a reward for it. But Allah gives us a bonus. Bonus meaning over and above that which is compulsory. Let's see what you do. You want to engage in voluntary prayer. You want to give voluntary charity. That is now a bonus. It's something more. Competition now. Yes, competition with one another over and above that. And then what happens is there are prohibitions that we stay away from, we earn reward for. Sometimes a prohibition dangles in front of your eye for Allah to give you the opportunity to earn a greater reward. So like lowering the gaze is something that is very rewarding. It, it achieves great calmness. You know, I was speaking to one uh, young boy uh, and he told me, you know, I heard uh, about this uh, lowering gaze and I tried it out. This was just, he was saying, I tried it out. And he says, I'm so happy because now uh, he was a married young man. And he says, you know, I, I'm so happy. Whenever I look down, I feel the sense of calmness. And w w before when I used to look at all the females and all, you know, the opposite sex, I, inside my heart, I used to think, oh no, I wish I could have this or I wish this. Now that wish is not there because I know what is mine is mine. And I know that there are certain things that will never be mine. But it's a test. If I want happiness, I need to follow the rules, inshallah, and I will be able to achieve. So he was telling me, and I learned a lot because first-hand experience where people tell you that, you know, we have achieved this peace and it is something that is so great. You just need to experience it. For me and you to talk about it is one thing, but for someone to enter into the fold and to actually feel what it's like is something else. So the, the sweet taste cannot be described. So you have to taste it yourself. Yes, so we cannot describe it to its tea, but we can try to explain try what to it explain will be. It as yes. much as, yes. This actually uh, reminds me of our responsibility, our role towards raising our kids in, in a secure and peaceful uh, environment. How do we go about this? It's important as parents to choose the right schools, to choose uh, the right spouse to start with. You know, many times young people just look at the next prettiest woman and they want to marry her, not thinking that will she be a candidate to be the best mother possible for my future kids. You know, Umar ibn Khattab anhu, is recorded to have said that one of the rights of your unborn children is that you select for them a spouse in advance that will be uh, the best for them. Preparing so, the environment preparing for Preparing them. So this is part of the Islamic teaching, you know, and it's so beautiful because uh, when the husband and wife you know love each other they grow each, uh, together in the obedience of Allah automatically they will choose the best for their children and we try obviously the environment is not always uh, you know uh, conducive sometimes you find some hostilities in the environment in terms of negative media or negative uh, maybe uh, you know influences but that is the challenge the challenge is to raise the child as best as you can given the environment that you have uh, the choices of have you made the best choice this is why neighborhood you know when you are choosing a neighborhood to live in it's extremely important to look at the neighbors before you buy the house in the arabic language there is a saying al jaru qabla dar you know you look at your neighbors before you actually b b purchase the house this is because of peace you want peace how can you buy a house in a neighborhood where everyone is on drugs for, or, or should i say it has it is notoriously known as a crime area or a drug area or things like that, it would be foolish. So uh, to, to, to bring up our children is a great act of worship. It is actually passing the baton. You know, if you see the relays when they're running around in, in, in the, uh, the athletics, you find the 100 meter relay. After 100 meters, they pass the baton on. After 100 meters, they pass the baton on. Life with our children is more or less similar. After a few years, you pass the baton on to your children. After a few years, they will pass the baton on to the next children. What is that baton? It is the relation with the maker. And that is the, the, the peace that will be achieved within through Islam. And Islam is uh, the surrendering to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, you know, we always believe that we need to market the deen uh, even in a more beautiful way than people market their products. 
because today you have beautiful adverts, people marketing products. I mean, look at this uh, uh, Dubai Peace Con Convention. It is marketed in such a beautiful way. I went through the exhibition today and I was so impressed thinking the children of today are more fortunate than myself and yourselves. When we were growing up, we did not have you know, such technology to, try to tell us the stories of the prophets in so much uh, of uh, an interesting way that we would remember. So, mashallah, it's so good. I think that you brought this point because I was about to ask you about the relationship between Islam with social media, especially from your uh, own experience. You know, uh, people think Islam is a backward religion and, you know, we need to sit back and we need to, you know, not make use of. But Islam, if in actual fact, uh, I will be talking about this, uh, inshallah, at the convention. And one of the main points is if you go back to the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and we take our lessons from his life, you will find something extremely interesting. You know, when he was writing, obviously he, he did not read or write, but when he sent the letters <coughs> to the uh, leaders of Afar, uh, what he did is when he was sending the letters to the Romans, there was something interesting that happened. He was told, you know, they will not read your letter unless it is stamped, you know. So he said, okay, let's, make, let's get that stamp done. He did not say, oh, this is their way, it's not our way, we should not do it, you know. Today we would use the term bid'ah, obviously that's because now the sunnah is, is recorded. But he did not say, okay, it's their way, don't do it. He said, let's do it because... So he got a stamp. Yes, so the idea was to use whatever the latest technology was at that time in order to uh, uh, project the message as far and wide as possible. Uh, and he did it. Because writing and reading was not the in thing. A lot of people could not read or write, as you know, at the time. But still, he said, no, we will write it and we will stamp it and we will send it and we will do whatever is needed to get the message across. So from that beautiful narration, we learn that today, it's, it may we not have be... To, to connect we with have to connect with whatever we have. And if have we to. don't, we are wrong. So whether we are using, you know, the internet, the social networking, Facebook, you know, uh, YouTube, the Twitter and so on, there are so many ways of using it. You can either use it uh, detrimentally, which would be to your detriment and to your harm and damage, or you can use it in a positive way. So I would like to encourage all the viewers and you know, uh, the entire ummah and humanity at large to use these things uh, in a way that would benefit us, in a way that would be very beneficial to spread peace and to spread that which is good. There are so many people, sadly, uh, I have a heavy, heavy presence on Facebook and Twitter, and what I notice, many people are vulgar, they swear, uh, they have no respect sometimes. But Alhamdulillah, the, the number of people who are showing the goodness is increasing. The positiveness is the there. The positiveness is definitely so, there. So we have to combine between the practical uh, lessons that we get and uh, also the modern one. Uh, any special dua to get peace or inner peace? Uh, you know, there are so many du'as. One of the best du'as that come to my mind is the du'a that is read immediately after Salah, yeah. where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, after the prayer, uh, he used to uh, ask Allah's forgiveness, astaghfirullah, and then he used to say, Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam. You know, oh Allah, you are the, 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 the giver of peace and peace comes from you. And we are asking you for the peace. So internal peace, external peace. We will achieve it through prayer because prayer itself is a very, very peaceful uh, set of words and actions. Uh, it starts with Allahu Akbar, obviously, and it ends with the salam. But even if you watch a person praying in the proper way, the non-Muslims have confirmed as well that you just need to witness a Muslim pray and it's amazing how you see the calmness in this beautiful prayer. It happened you to me once. You see this with the new Muslims many times. It's very apparent when yes. they first experience they enjoy it. it. And, and you know, some, some of the Muslims might not know the meanings of the wordings they read in Salah. So the more you know, the more you concentrate, the more peace you will have. And, and this is why I encourage the Muslims to really make an effort to learn the meanings of what you are saying in Salah and to, to do it calm and, and you know, like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Salli Salata Muwadda'in. When you pray, pray as though it's going to be your last opportunity uh, uh, in a way that uh, you will be able to concentrate and you, as you see the peace that is achieved, inshallah. Inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Thank you very much for joining us and for sharing, uh, sharing with us your thoughts and ideas. Barakallah fiqh. And I appreciate that I hope you've had me here. Most welcome. Jazakallah, Jazakallah khair. khair. I hope, inshallah, that the viewers will benefit from it and everyone and we look forward to your lectures, inshallah. Barakallah fiqh. Shukran. Thank, thank you, you so much. Your viewers, I'd like to thank on your behalf our guest Mufti Ismail Mink and all the guests who shared with us today their thoughts and ideas. We supplicate to Allah Almighty to help us understand our religion better and practice it in the best way we can. Amen. We pray to Allah Almighty to teach us what benefits us and benefit us with what we learn and increase us in knowledge and guide us and guide others through us 
and make us merciful and compassionate, moderate and balanced in our hearts and in our actions and in all aspects of our life. And grant us good things in this world and good things in the hereafter. I mean, thank you very much and see you again, inshallah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Peace be upon you and the mercy of Allah and His grace.